and just give it a few seconds. I'll give you a thumbs up when, when it's live. Hi, I'm Linda Van Hart, Visual Arts Coordinator for Common Ground on the Hill. Welcome to week two, Gallery Talk 3. Tonight, we're learning about fiber and wearable arts, such as needle felting, baskets, beaded jewelry, and braided hair. We're working with Lenora, with Keith, with Joanne and Carly. Uh, some of the classes did not go because of attendance issues this year, but we want to introduce these classes to you since some of our instructors will be returning next year. And we want you to see how wonderful this class would be if you wanted to choose to take it. As you well know, Gallery Talks is a wonderful place to shop for next year's classes when we all hope we will be live and in person together again on McDaniel campus. So tonight, Lenora will be talking with you about needle felting. Go ahead, Lenora. Okay. So um, I was gonna share my screen Okay, so I had to figure out what to say about needle felting that was different from what I said last year. But uh, I thought I would try to show you the, the perspective from beginning to end. And so I'm going to start with how I began. This is the first needle felted landscape I ever did. Uh, I did it on a piece of blanket that was an eco printing disaster. And I had some paint, hand painted roving that I had bought for a class. And I had some snippets of alpaca that came out of unraveling a poncho that my sister had brought me from Bolivia in 1968. And when I put this picture up on Facebook, I got so many compliments uh, on it that that made me decide that I wanted, wanted to continue. But then I got involved in the whole picture of needle felting from sheep to product. So we'll take a little visit here. This is my friend Lucia's farm and uh, the lambs have just been born and they're just having the best time of their life uh, eating the tall grass. Well, Lucia raises lambs for meat. She doesn't do anything with the wool. If nobody takes it from her, it ends up on the compost pile. Here's one more picture of the, the, the little babies having fun. So this is how I get wool from Lucia. It has straw in it. It has not been cleaned. Um, so I have learned how to scour it and I have learned how to dye it. So, so far I've only been dyeing it with chemical dyes, synthetic dyes, but this is my landscape palette and you'll see this palette in uh, the, the piece that I'm about to show you pretty soon. So needle felting uses these special needles and they have sharp little barbs and you press them you push them into the the fiber and it pushes the fiber through to the back I took out a broken needle. I wondered why it wouldn't push through very well. But you're basically painting with wool. And there's my, there's my palette, as opposed to 
it's just all my colors are, are laid out there for me to use. I've just started learning how to dye with natural materials, uh, various vegetable materials. And hopefully by next year, I'll have not only a pile of synthetically dyed wool, but also some naturally dyed wool. So this is the result of that dyeing. I call this sycamore sunset. It has all the wonderful uh, variegation of the sycamore. And here is some detail showing you that you can have, that you basically can have a flat surface or you can have a relief surface. And then another one of the paintings that I did with a wool that I dyed from Lucia is Mountain Birches. And I said I'd go full circle and there is a sheep. And this sheep is not made with Lucia's wool. I was on vacation in England. Uh, I went there to buy a drum carter so that I could uh, help prepare the, the wool for my felting. And as I was walking down the street, there was a store that had felting materials. And I was working on a large piece that I didn't take with me. So I bought a small piece of pre-felt, two kinds of local wool to make the locks. And the next day I went to see a garden and there was a needle felter doing the uh, work at the gate, admission gate. And it was my birthday and she gave me a bunch of colors from her stash. And so that ended up too in the, the sheep's uh, picture. So I look forward to teaching this on site next year and to having many of you there and learning how easy it is to paint with wool. The thing I like best about it as an art medium is that it's portable. I can do needle felting in the car. I rarely do it sitting at home, but I, I do it while I'm traveling. And there are, I, it, you can't do watercolors that way. I'm a fool for landscapes. I'm taking Sue's, since my class got canceled, I'm taking Sue Mass with a uh, monoprint, uh, watercolor monoprint class. And we're doing landscapes and I'm, it's a great consolation prize. Thank you, okay. Adora. You wanna stop sharing your screen? There I we did. go. Thank you. Very fun. Uh, Keith came to us first as a student many years ago and Right away, his enthusiasm and his passion for weaving was apparent. Joyce Shaw, many of you might remember uh, Joyce teaching with us. And uh, Keith quickly became a groupie and they started having basket making parties. And pretty soon Keith was hosting them and I, I hear they're really a lot of fun. So any of you who have been in a class with Keith or taken a class from Keith, know that he is just effusive about his uh, love of weaving. He never tires of it. His curiosity leads him to newer and more difficult patterns constantly. He tries different sizes, he tries different shapes, different kinds of handles. The variety is truly amazing. And I'm so glad that he has a little more time to himself uh, since he retired from being media specialist. Keith, tell us and show us what you've been making. Thanks, Linda. Um, as you heard, my name is Keith Taylor and I'm a basket maker, a hobbyist, not a professional. I don't sell my baskets, but I uh, love to make baskets and I love to show others how to make baskets. I started making baskets in about 2005 at uh, Westminster High School 
at the adult ed, continuing ed, in the evening I would go and started making baskets. Um, unfortunately, that instructor retired and it wasn't the easiest thing to find another instructor, but I did happen to find someone at Roland Park Country School that was teaching Nantucket baskets. So I went and I learned how to do those. I then came upon Common Ground in about 2010 and have been taking, as Linda said, Joyce's class ever since. And she became kind of my mentor. And then I just um, moved right in and took over when Joyce was no longer able to do it. And it was a common ground that I learned about the three types of basket construction. There's the spoke construction, which we'll look at in a little bit. And then there, and this was, I learned with Joyce. And with Sharon Schaefer's classes, I learned all about the rib construction. And with Mary Graham Grant, I learned about the coil, the uh, Charleston, South Carolina sweetgrass baskets. And these were all baskets that I made in their classes when I took them. So my students today, uh, or this week, my basket students are learning the two different types of spoke construction. They're making a tote basket, which is a, a start and stop, which each row is separate. They begin and end at the same place. So this is just a start and stop weave, and this is one of the ones that they're making. The other spoke basket would be a continuous weave, which means it's a spiral and it wraps around. And when you get to the top, you taper it off so that your basket rim is level and then you put your rim on. So those are the two types of spoke baskets that we're looking at. Some of them have a fixed handle and some of them have a handle that we're going to add to it later. Um, I fell in love with the Nantucket baskets and actually this is the first Nantucket basket that I made. And it looks pretty much like the last ones that I made because they're made on a mold the base is screwed on and you weave over the mold. And when you get up to where you want your rim, you take it off, you add your rim, the handle if you're going to put a handle on it. And right here is the plug where I put in there the where it was screwed onto that. So that's a Nantucket basket. Um, I have several examples of Nantucket baskets. I taught Nantucket baskets um, two years ago, and we had the, the students had the choice of making the cylinder vase because it's made around a mold. And this mold actually is a glass vase inside, and the base is adhered to the glass mold, and we weave up the side of the glass mold. But it can also be something like a galvanized bucket. And this would be like a beer bucket that you can ice your beers down and the weave, the uh, reed is woven right up around the galvanized bucket till you get above the bucket and then you can apply the, the rim at that point. The thing about Nantucket's that kind of, after you make about a hundred of them, you get kind of tired of them because everyone, like I said, looks the same. When you pull it off the mold, the first one looks like the 12th one, looks like the 20th one. So I started to break from the tradition and you saw those were all natural, decided to start using color for my spokes and weave patterns that I learned from uh, Joyce and Carolyn Freitag into my Nantucket basket. So this is untraditional. Um, but you can see it's got the pattern, a, a, a lazy twill, the diamond, um, and it's got the color in it. The reed itself, the cane cannot be dyed because it still has the bark of the bamboo on the outside. So it won't accept the stain. The only thing you can stain are your staves, which are made out of the same reed that we're using in my class. Um, some other baskets that I did was I like to play with pattern, as you saw there. And as Linda said, one of the earliest ones I did was a class with Carolyn Freitag. And this is just called a sampler basket where you, you weave up so high and then you do a pattern and then you weave and then you do a different pattern and yet a different pattern, like a like a um, a needlepoint sampler that has all different uh, patterns in it. 
this basket is one that has different ones. Uh, this is a spoke basket. This is a continuous weave as well. So as you heard, I like to play with pattern. This is what my intermediate students made last year. This is the same tote that you saw, but it's done with smaller reed so that the pattern can be woven in. There's a lot of math, as I found out, in uh, basket making, because when you do something like this, you want your pattern to start and stop and be continuous all the way around and not be interrupted. So you have to make sure that you have the right number of spokes and the right number of rows so that your pattern is complete. One of the largest ones I did with Joyce, and I guess I'll have to step back, is the hamper. And you can see this pattern is the, pretty much the same pattern that I just showed you on the tote. This was one where not only did we have to deal with size, and this is considered a cat head, but we also had to have a lid that would fit on top of the basket. So that's, that was my largest one. I have two favorite ones. This is one of them because this was just an opportunity for me to experiment and play with color and pattern. And I wanted it to look like almost confetti falling down. So the rows are interrupted by natural. And some of this is just applied later on top of the natural reed. Whereas this top row of blue is, goes all the way around this row here is interrupted and it's actually a natural row where just yellow was added in some spots and orange was added over, like overlaid on top of it. I think when people come to my house, their favorite is the Victorian laundry basket. And I have some of my students and I show these in my class and I said, you know, we can make any of these that you want, but we won't make this one the second class. We'll be making this one after you've been in my class, maybe four or five years, because it took me a while. And this is, I usually weave a basket watching television. This I cannot weave while watching television. There's a lot of counting and a lot of math. This is a shaker style, cat head, Victorian laundry basket. Now, the nice thing about um, having Joyce as my mentor and my teacher was, I would challenge her so that she could challenge me. And I'd say, Joyce, I want to, I want to learn how to do this. I already know how to weave a basket, but I don't know how to weave a basket with a lid. Yeah. That lid you saw on the laundry basket was almost like weaving a separate basket that just fit on here. But this one is a um, colonial feather basket. So during the colonial times when they would gather the feathers from the ducks or the geese, they would, put the feather in and the basket lid would come right back. Now this basket lid is pretty much the same style as the laundry basket. That's a shaker quadrifoil there. And the bottom is a cat head. You'll notice here that it is a, there's a line that kind of goes around and that's a lazy twill because this was a continuous weave. It's one that goes around. But because I had the same number of spokes or an even number of spokes, I had to skip so that it would keep going or else it would be start and stop. Lastly, I'm going to show you just a few things that you can apply or embellish a basket. You can make the basket and then come back to it later, like the one that had the rainbow confetti on it. This basket was made. And then later, like counted cross stitch, this was applied with the wet reed, this pattern. Um, the handles of the egg baskets, we spent a lot of time in Sharon's class embellishing the handles. And um, even that, uh, the egg basket right there, yes, sorry, my helpers. My, actually, they're my students. I had students that came down here, Linda, to to weave baskets with me. And they're standing off camera, handing me stuff or taking stuff. But you can see here, we also embellish the handles of this one. Um, Sharon was very big into doing the um, handles in her classes, which I, I love to learn to do. And finally, you said that, um, how have I, how have, how I've had more time to experiment and stuff. So back in Carroll County, I'd go to the auction and I'd find these beautiful antlers 
from a hunter that was getting rid of them. And I would buy them and make antler baskets. But down here, it's not antlers that we're using. I'm trying to find driftwood and shells that I can incorporate into my basket making. So you'll have to look for that next time. And hopefully you'll be uh, excited to sign up for the split read basket classes. Back to you, Linda. Thank you, Keith. That was wonderful as always. You amaze me. That Victoria laundry basket makes me dizzy just looking inside it. I can't imagine weaving that. It's so large. How long did something like that take you? Well, all of those were done. All of those were done in the week that I was in Joyce's class. Uh, not to say that I didn't take it home in the evening and work on it, but um a lot of my basket making is it's become muscle memory and I, I, I do it without even thinking and I'm moving along at a, at a pretty fast pace. And one, I had to really think and step back this week because I was weaving my baskets and then I looked at what my students were doing and I'm like, Oh, I should tell them about this tip because I just did it without even thinking that they don't have the, the background, the past basket making that I have that over time I've discovered, oh, I need to put my finger here to hold this so that the reed will do this, uh, you know? So um, I'm pretty fast when it comes to weaving a basket, but even that, that took a week because I would say I wove some and then I unwove part of that basket and then I wove it again until it was finally finished. Well, that's a beauty. Yes, I look forward to seeing the ones with driftwood and shells. Thank you, Keith. Mm -hmm. We're moving on to Joanne Bost. Joanne practices many craft forms, but she's well known for her intricate beading. And like many of us, she does high-end craft shows and um, sells her work as, as well as wearing it. Tell us about your, uh, what are we doing, beaded? We're doing some beaded jewelry, I think. Uh, yes. Can I, uh, can I bring up my PowerPoint? I need to get rid of my sure. uh, desktop. Desktop. Share. Okay. Let me get rid of this. Get rid of this. Sorry, I normally prepare this, but I had trouble with the computer. Oh, come on. I'm waiting for it. It looks like it's going to open. Mm -hmm. There we go. It's not opening. Yes, it is. Oh, it's there we open. go. Sorry, if I'd had myself charged properly, I would have had this ready. Um, since uh, I'm not teaching anything this week, I'm taking all the classes, I feel free to just play and show you what I do when I play. Uh, I do have three favorite stitches. One is peyote, which is the one in green. One is brick stitch, which is the one in blue. And then the orange is right angle weave. In peyote, your thread goes through a bead hole, through the next bead hole, through the next bead hole, so that it's lined up and you have your thread going continuously from one bead to another. In brick stitch, the beads are lined up with their little holes parallel to each other like little soldiers. Um, so the thread goes through a bead, around a thread, and back up through the bead. So the thread path is very different. But the interesting thing is, if you take one of these and turn it on its side, they mesh perfectly. So if you want to play around, you can switch back and forth from peyote to brick stitch and stitch off in any direction. And I like to play by switching back and forth between various stitches. The right angle weave has as its basis a circle of four beads. 
which then gives you a very bias and drapeable kind of fabric. It can be a circle of four beads or a circle of any multiple of four beads. And here at the bottom, the more open work is a circle of eight beads. These are some bracelets. Just freeform playing, taking one stitch, switching to another stitch, and doing whatever I feel like doing to end up with the length of a bracelet. Some of them have some artist-made lamp work beads in them. Uh, they have areas of brick stitch, areas of peyote stitch, and some of them will have some areas of right angle weave as well. Again, just switching back and forth from one stitch to another, doing whatever I can to complement the focal piece that I've decided to start with. Here's a geometric necklace. Here's the focal piece, this piece of glass here. And these geometrics pick up the color and the pattern of the original glass. Again, a geometric piece. I can't even tell you by looking at this which ones were done in peyote and which ones were done in brick stitch because it would depend on the orientation of the piece as I was working on it. You can, however, tell by feel because brick stitch has much more thread in it than peyote and makes for a much stiffer and more supportive structure. One other thing about brick stitch that I like is that when you start brick stitch, this little magenta in here is the original line of brick stitch. You can take it and curve it. You see the way this one is curved? Fix the curve by decreasing on one side and increasing on the other side and end up making a shape or a picture that is that has curves. When you work with peyote stitch, your pictures are mostly pixelated. Here is another necklace. This bottom is brick stitch, where I've used very large beads, established them in a curve, and when I get to the edge, work off the edge in peyote stitch. This is just plain playing. These are these focal beads are a resin bead, so they're very light. And I just did whatever I felt like it off the edge. Peyote, brick, and right angle weave, mostly. And sometimes the stitching wraps around the beads. Sometimes it goes behind them. Sometimes it goes through them. Lastly, this is a more complicated piece. I was asked by a lady that I know to do a necklace for her. This is a commission piece. She wanted a Finding Nemo necklace. So I used these. This is uh, Marlin down here. Here's Nemo up here, smaller and lighter bead. These are carved Taga nuts that are made by uh, the... the uh, uh, I, I believe it's the Panama area where these are carved and hand painted. Um, when you're dealing with, uh, you know, any kind of Disney related character, you want to make sure that you're not copying the copyrighted image, but using the themes from the movie in various different ways. So here I have Marlon and Nemo. As a background here, I've used right angle weave because I wanted something drapey to act like water. These little areas here, and you can see them larger here, are peyote stitch that is ruffled by massive increases to make the jellyfish. Over here to support Nemo is a base of brick stitch. And this bottom here is the, uh, the current and if you look in here, there's little glass turtles that are also incorporated into the right angle weave uh, current stitch. Since this gal had very short hair, I put a jellyfish counterweight in the back. And the catch is actually hidden under Nemo as he sits in his little anemone being protected from the outside world. So I find it fun to think about um a story 
and work the piece switching back and forth from whatever stitch I decide I like to use at that moment, whatever stitch provides the function for what it is I need, and just play. My basic theory about beadwork is that if you take your needle as it's attached to your beadwork, you stick it in a bead, you stick the needle back in your beadwork, and you pull on the thread. If the, if the bead doesn't fall off, it's right. Okay, so that's it. Thank you, Joanne. That's a gorgeous piece. It's always fun and very challenging to get a commission because you want to make something that will suit the person, but you, you also want to express yourself. And the color combination in this piece is just gorgeous. Well, we started with the blue greens here to complement the red orange in marlin and went to the straight blues to complement the more yellow orange that the the fish i chose for nemo is and as i said there's a lot of thought involved but to me if i know where i'm going before i start i've lost interest we were just i that same I, I, I need i need the carrot of making decisions as i go yes I'm the same way, Joanne. We were just discussing that in found object sculpture because one of the participants said, well, should I sketch this out? And I'm like, no, <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you know where you're going to end up, it gets boring. It's just like reading a recipe or something. I, you, you can just, the spontaneity is like breathing in this piece. It's just really beautiful. Thank you, Joanne. Do you want to stop sharing your screen? Yes. How do I do that? Okay. Go there. Um, I think you can just go to the bottom uh, tool row and where it says share screen, just click on it. You know, I closed it. I don't have it open anymore because I was trying to get rid of things so that I could see my, my, uh, my presentation. I, I. Hi, Joanne. This is Allie. I'll oh, just. Oh, there it is. Stop share. Yep. There you go. Gotcha. Uh, this. <laughs> You're fine. You're fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. That was wonderful. We'll come back to. Don't let me forget to come back to the math involved in basketry and beading. Um, Carly Miller uh, could teach a class with us every week and she would have full classes and a wait list for everyone. Um, and I keep encouraging her every year. Carly, where's Carly? I keep encouraging Carly. She started a book. Uh, a couple of years ago, but it has some pictures of other people's braiding. And I, I think with uh, cell phone photography and the number of people she has braiding with her, we, we need to get that book out. Um, there she is. Um, Carly is completely fluent in Spanish, right? Uh, so if you are, if, if Spanish is a love of yours or you're working on that in addition to braiding, Carly can help you out with your language skills. <laughs> Tell us about your braiding class. I, hopefully we're going to see a demonstration tonight. We will see. I've got some other stuff I was going to show you guys. And I'm not even sure how you know that I speak Spanish, um, but I, I used to be a Spanish teacher. So um, I'm not sure about maybe teaching a class in Spanish, but anyway, if anyone needs Spanish help, <laughs> there you go. Uh, my name is Carly Miller. I just wanna say welcome everybody. And um, as always, uh, Linda knows, I am so very grateful to be here. Um, I really, really enjoy being an instructor for, for Common Ground. I have been here for plenty of years and I every year it's just, it's awesome. I feel like I'm coming home. So uh, this year I get to do virtual. 
and um, I taught last week and I'm teaching this week and I have wonderful students as always. And I'm just excited to talk a little bit about braiding hair. Um, I think backing up a little bit when we talk about perspective and like how this happens, because it's so beautiful because anybody can braid. Um, it's so simple. And what I love about it, um, Lenora was talking about, you can take it anywhere. And it's the same philosophy with braiding. You don't need a lot of tools. I was showing my students today. I have a little comb for parts that you really don't need and a hair tie. That's really it. Um, you don't need much and kids can braid and older folks can braid and it's just this beautiful, beautiful thing. I started when I was nine years old. Uh, my babysitter taught me how to braid. And I just, I just, it was such a thing then. It was so popular and it was so great. And I felt like I was in, like into a club at that point in time. Like I had that skill and most of the kids in my elementary school could not braid. So it was just this instant, like I could do that and people wanted, wanted braids. And then, so I'm passing along the gift and I didn't necessarily start teaching until I was much older. I was also an athlete for a number of years and it was so nice. Um, this was almost out of necessity to keep your hair out of your face. So I ended up braiding everybody's hair, um, mostly for games. Um, and my braids are typically just technique and style wise are very tight um, without hurting folks. So they stay in and they stay in during games. You can sleep in them and it's, it's pretty nice to have that. Um, fast forward, um, I am a teacher currently and I work at a residential school, which is awesome. Uh, but in the evenings, I'm pretty tired. So during uh, recess, I don't have a lot of energy to go play basketball or Foursquare or hang out with the kids that way. So I decided to just start braiding and that's where it really started. And that's where it became a thing. Um, I started having lines of students that just wanted their hair braided and I, I became like the braider at school. And it was just this fun thing to do. Um, it continued with a, a business actually um, because I, I work some small festivals. I don't market myself too much just because I'm pretty busy and I have a lot on my plate, um, but I do work some festivals and weddings. Um, and my latest piece has been how to braid parties. So people bring their uh, moms or whoever, grandmoms bring in the, their granddaughter or niece or daughter, neighbor, and then they learn and that's how we do it. So it's kind of like a common ground class, either virtually or in your house. So it's been fun. Um, and then common ground came along. So that was just like, kind of like elevated it to a different level and it's just been wonderful. However, I used to just braid hair and I feel like, yes, I still braid hair, but I've taken it to a just different level because of common ground. I felt like when I was accepted as an instructor, um, it, I had to take it to a different level and I was so excited and I wanted to fit into the common ground ideal. Uh, so I started doing research. And that's where things changed for me. I started looking at cultures from all across the planet. And not only was I looking at these cultures, but I was realizing there's a lot of patterns um, and, and just similarities between cultures. And so I realized because of common ground that braiding is so much more than literally putting a pattern on someone's head. It's, it transcends time. And it cuts, it's a tradition that cuts across like racial and social and economic and geographic lines. Um, the cultures that I focus on, it's kind of my beginning of every class because I want it to be so much more than braiding. Um, I start out with African tribes. So we look at African tribes and, and how braiding is incorporated into their own culture. That's day one. Um, the second day is one of my favorites because I just grew up loving Native American culture, uh, but I really focus on Native Americans. We just talk about kind of the big pieces what's important in their cultures and their tribes. On day three, I look at medieval and Renaissance braids. A lot of people think to me, am I a Renaissance braider? If you've ever been to a Renaissance festival, uh, they, have a, they typically have a braiding booth. Um, I'd like to think of myself as a um, similar, but a lot cheaper. So on a budget, um, the braids at Renaissance festivals are pretty expensive. And I, to me, it was silly to charge that much money. And so that's where my little braiding booth comes along, but it's much, much, much cheaper, more cost-effective. Um, and then the next day we look at the Egyptians, which to me initially, I never really thought when I, when I think about braids in my head and culturally who's wearing braids, who's braiding, I don't think about the Egyptians, um, but it's pretty great. And it's pretty interesting that there have been mummies that have been dug up and have braids in their hair and, um, actually have an extensions 
like hair extensions that have been sewn in and then braided. So it was, it was a big deal. And in, in that time period, which was pretty great. Um, before I talk about the last day I have had the last two weeks, this, this year teaching people have recommended the Vikings, which I feel like maybe I need to incorporate into my curriculum in the future. Cause that's pretty fun with the beards and all the, um, the gorgeous braids and hairstyles. The last day on Friday, we focus on pop culture and what's happening today in 2021 on the red carpet. Because braiding, even today, is still popular. I talked about it back in the day when I was in third grade, but it's it's huge. The girls at my school go crazy when they realize I can braid. Um, it's still fun. You still look at proms today and homecoming and, and weddings, and there's oftentimes a braid that's incorporated into that hairstyle. So it's it's pretty awesome and pretty relevant skill. Um, one last thing too, before I talk about the braids that I do, is I think it's just so so um, intimate. It's so beautiful because other people like we're, we're making beads or baskets or needle felting and you're working with um, other materials. But when you're braiding, you're literally touching someone's head. And that's a really big deal. It's super intimate, super personal. Um, it, it's tribal in itself. And I always feel like it really is kind of a gift. Um, I found some really great photos that I've shown my students of these like grandmothers that have passed down the trait to their daughter and they're braiding their daughter's hair who's braiding like this little young girl. So it's this generational uh, skill that's passed down much like storytelling. So I just think it's a beautiful thing. Braids also, um, beyond just having this pattern, this beautiful artwork on your head, they can absolutely affect confidence and self-esteem and bring folks together. I mentioned earlier as being an athlete, uh, it's pretty awesome to have a whole bunch of folks with the exact same braid makes you feel like a warrior, like a tribe, like you're going out and you're ready to work together. And it's pretty amazing how it can bring folks together. When you braid someone's hair, I've seen it the last two weeks, even virtually uh, with my students braiding their daughter's hair. As soon as they have this braid, they just stand up taller and they have this big, huge, genuine grin. And they're so excited to have their hair braided. So without further ado, I'm gonna stop talking and well, I'm gonna keep talking, but I'm gonna show you some of the braids that I do teach. Um, the braids are on my book that, that Linda mentioned, and I just put a book together. Honestly, it was just, I needed a visual. Um, I started taking pictures. Most of them are, I think 90% of the book are mine. They were just, I'd braid my friend's daughter's hair and then say, can I get a quick picture? Um, and then, so they're in here and that's, the book has become my curriculum, which is really nice for common ground. And Linda has mentioned time and time again, I need to get that book out there. I just haven't had a chance to make it completely my own. So that's the reason why it's not for sale or out on the market. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, and show you some of the braids that we have been working on this week. We actually did this one today. Um, this is a really fun one. It's a variation. So you got these patterns and cool perspectives and the, it's so great too, when we talk about perspective, looking at different angles um, on someone's head. So when I'm showing off, I don't have a braided right now, my mannequin. When I'm showing my students, I'll do a demo. And then I always show looking straight on, looking down. So you're looking from the, you know, from looking at the top of the head, you're looking at the left, you're looking at the right, you're looking at the back. And we looked at these different perspectives because it always is different. This is what I call the zigzag braid. Um, I've named all of my own braids. They're not uh, copyrighted. And so if you go to look for the zigzag braid, I'm on YouTube, I'm pretty sure you won't find it. Um, but again, I've just used names um, just to differentiate between the braids. But this is a really cool one that you're only pulling from one side. Traditionally, French braids are pulling from both sides. Uh, and this is just a one pull. And, it, and then this is just as fluidity and movement of this braid is so fun. And we actually worked on it today. All right, let's see the next one. Uh, this one I do not teach for common ground because your fingers fall off when you're finished with this one. It's just a spiral braid. So it's the idea of almost like a crown, but you just keep going and then have a little bun at the top. Uh, I'm a really, really fast braider. I was loving that Keith was talking about this muscle memory because I use that term so frequently. I, when I'm braiding, I don't even have to look at the head anymore. I can have full conversations. I can watch TV and it's really quick. I can do most of my braids in about two, two to three minutes. This one, not so much. So I don't teach this one because it's pretty complicated. But I thought it was pretty beautiful in that gorgeous red hair. Uh, we do learn this one. This is going to be a, 
another variation of a braid, and this is a two strand braid. Typically braids are gonna be three strands. And this is called the fishtail. So if you've ever heard of a fishtail is what it resembles, I think that's where it gets its name. I did not name that braid, um, but it is a fishtail and it reminds me, it's got this Native American vibe, but I just think it's such a beautiful and, and it creates this really thick, um, almost like a rope-like when it's finished. Love this one. This is the Dutch braid. It's an inverted French braid. Uh, some folks call it the upside down braid. So instead of going over for a French braid, you're going under and then it pops out and it's kind of 3D on your head. It's not laying flat. And I think it's just gorgeous. So this was a crown Dutch braid that I did at a festival. Uh, we learned this one yesterday in class. This is an Elsa braid. I only call it the Elsa braid because my daughter loves Frozen and it it's, resembles the main character in Frozen, Elsa. Um, starting on the side and kind of going around the perimeter and then ending up on the side uh, view. This is a cascade braid. We actually did this one today. My students were awesome with this one. Um, another rendition of that uh, French braid and only pulling from one side and then kind of cascading down the back of the head. This is a half up do and it's, it's pretty, I think it's beautiful. Oh, okay. I had to do this. And Linda, you were not here last week. I was so excited. Um, this is how I want to finish. <laughs> So you can braid anything, well, maybe not everything, but you, there's a lot of things you can braid out there. And I love to make pies. And Linda, before, I'm gonna stop you right here because I know you're gonna think I should be doing braiding pies as a common ground class. I know where your brain's going and I'm not, I'm not interested in braiding pies for class, but um, I always make pies for the holidays um, because honestly, I like to eat pies. It's really more about eating it than making them, but um, a couple of years ago, I had all this dough and I was like, you know what? I think I want to do something with it. And so I'm like, I'm going to braid it. So this was my first try. This is a, a pumpkin pie that I went for. Um, I thought it looked pretty beautiful, but then I was like, there's much more I can do. So I started getting a little creative. Um, and I also, I, while I love pumpkin pie, apple pie is my go-to. So I have some more pie pictures. And again, I'm not braiding pie for common ground, but this is just about braiding. And these are all my pies and I'm pretty excited about them. I thought that one was pretty cool with a little cinnamon touch because you need cinnamon on your apple pie. Um, Keith, I'm trying to make you proud here. This is not your Nantucket or all your crazy stitches, but th that are some weaving going on there. Uh, so I did a woven crust and then I took my dough and made a whole bunch of strands of braids. And then I did some strips in just to throw out a little bit and a little flare on that one. That was a delicious pie. This one I thought was beautiful. Wow. Um, so I love nature. I'm an environmental educator uh, by trade. And so of course I had to throw a couple of leaves on there as just some flair, um, but this was really fun to, to weave braids. So I'm incorporating a whole bunch of different types of craftsmanship into this pie. And it was amazing. The other reason why I love to make these decorative pies is because people don't want to eat them because they're so beautiful. So there's more for me because I did mention, I, lo I love pie. And the last one I think is my favorite. That's why I'm saving it for the last one. This is this one. Wow. I really love this one. Um, I like that it's not, it wasn't straight lines. It's kind of this linear uh, weave and then just a little fun little zigzag crust. Um, this one was a really foam and a braid, but it's, it was again, really delicious. And I got my little cinnamon on there too. So this has been fun for holidays for me when I have time. It doesn't look like it, well, actually it looks like it takes a lot of time, but it really doesn't. Once you cut out your dough and you braid it up, it's pretty easy and pretty forgiving at the same time, because if your dough breaks, you just put it right back together. It's like Play-Doh. And so these are really fun and they bake well and they taste amazing. So let me go ahead and stop that. So that's where I'm at. Um, I would love for people in the, and I hope to be here next year. So if you'd like to learn how to braid, um, please join my class. And thank you so much, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, Carly. What a tease to show me those braided pies and say you're not going to teach a braided pie class. <laughs> I feel a challenge coming on, Keith. Do you bake? <laughs> <laughs> Unmute yourself. Go down to the bottom left-hand corner. Right there. Okay. I, I did, as a matter of fact, I made a pie for the uh, common ground on the grill and we cooked it in the Dutch oven. 
And it's a it's a picture that usually was in the gallery that Gwen always shows uh, for the common ground on the grill was the pie that I did. But I didn't braid it. It was just a, a basket, a woven lat, a lattice top. That's awesome. Here's a challenge for you, Keith. I'm not thinking challenge. I'm thinking bring together some common ground instructors and see what we could, you know what I mean? Because you could do so many cool things like and bring our own craftsmanship into our pies. We could do the good, yeah, I don't know, maybe uh, the end of the week to a yeah. pie. A pie. I also brought your uh, braiding into the baskets. The two students that I have here that were helping me tonight, they're doing this basket and it has this braid, but it's actually twining, but it's three pieces that are uh, braided around the spokes. So we've incorporated some of that into our baskets as well. I love that you said that because the one thing I did want to say, and this has totally stuck with me throughout the years, and I tell my class about it every year, is I teach a twist. I'm actually going to do it really quickly. Um, it's super easy. It's just two pieces and you twist. I'm going to show it real quick on mine. You twist your hair together. I teach this on Friday. So I'm not going to tell you how to do it because you got to take my class. But we do this twist. If you do it correctly and you put a hair tie in, it stays in. So this is what it looks like. It's pretty beautiful. Well, I was down at um, <clears throat> the art studio and I was walking around and I went to the primitive skills class and I was really excited. And I went down there and I was just pumped to learn about some stuff. And he was making cordage, right? So string basically, and, and to make traps. And so he's stripping plants, which I thought was the coolest thing ever. And then he used the exact same technique to make his cordage. That's how ropes are made. That's how cords are made. And I was... When we talk about aha moments, I'm like, wait a second, I teach that in my braiding class. I didn't know that's how you make traps and like make cordage. And so there's just so many similarities and patterns that can like, you know, transcend all these classes. So I think it's great. So Keith, I'm glad that you guys are braiding as well. That's fun. Guy Neal uh, teaches that primitive skills class. It's very popular. And we've missed for the last two years, all those wonderful classes out in the Grove studio because People just can't make enormous bows out of green wood with, without the tools that guy has to do it or build the rose cabin. Can't wait till we uh, can be in person again next year and incorporate those, especially the three-dimensional uh, classes that we're so missing with the potter's wheels. Uh, thanks to Nicole Diem, she did do a hand-building ceramics class, but People just don't have potter's wheels and upright sanders and all the, the big porches and stuff. So it'll be good to incorporate that again. I like to think about braiding. I have uh, had metalsmithing students that use braiding and sometimes with round wire, but sometimes also with strips. Yes, uh-huh, a framed braided bracelet. So we were talking a little bit about math and Carly, you said that the two uh, strand fishtail weave was unusual because normally you, you braid with three strands. And Keith was saying how important math is. And I imagine in Joanne's work, math is pretty important with some of the, in the scale and the size. Um, Math is, is not my favorite. <laughs> How do you deal with, with math in your baskets, Keith? Well, like I said, it, it's like counted cross stitch. So I plot it all out on a graph paper the way that I want the pattern to appear on the basket. And then I'll go over the spokes where I want it to be seen and behind the spokes where I want it to not be seen. And what I need to make sure is that I have the right number of spokes of the basket so that the pattern will go all the way around. Uh, I just put that basket off to the side so I'd have to step over and get it. But uh, I do it on graph paper and I plot it out. And then I make sure that for every row of the graph paper, I have a spoke that comes up that I weave around. Allie, can you fix it so that the speaker fills the screen. So that's a plan you have to start with at the beginning. Joanne was talking about the fact that she likes to freewheel. 
Uh, she doesn't like yeah. to know how it's going to be at the end, but you pretty much have an idea. Well, yeah, even even when you start your basket, you have to have, I mean, I've experimented a lot with baskets, but to even measure the spokes that I need because I'll get going and then I run out of spokes. So my basket has to end. Um, so I have to plan it out some. Um, not to say I don't take parts out and redo it to because something else came into my mind or um but oftentimes I have to plan it all out so that I've cut my pieces long enough to fit, especially when we're doing things virtually. I have to guess how big the baskets are going to be that my students are going to make so that I'm sending them the materials that are going to fit their basket. Um, we did not. Well, this one we did the overhand over uh, handle but they're all doing bushel handles because I never know how tight their basket's going to be, whether it's going to be 10 inches, whether it's going to be 12 inches, whether it's going to be 14 inches to send them the handle because we all weave differently. Some of us are tighter and some of us are looser, just like my wife that crochets. Sometimes she's following a pat pattern and it should be so, so big when she's finished, but it's smaller or it's larger because of, the tightness of her crochet and that's the same with baskets so it's kind of hard doing it virtually i i have to take some of the guesswork out of it and measure things and mail it to them that way well there's a lot of spontaneity lenora was talking about the woman at the garden just giving her some stuff which she then turned into an unexpected uh needle felted landscape and your spontaneity, Keith, comes with the, the patterns that you put in or the embellishments that you add once the weave is finished in the basket. Joanne's just straight creativity. <laughs> She's got all the techniques and then she just, uh, the beads, the color of the beads or the, the function of the piece uh, help her create the piece. And then Carly, I, I can see that the color and the texture, the length of the hair would inspire you to try certain kinds of braids. It's just an, an abundance of creativity in this group. And that's what we like to celebrate in the visual arts at Common Ground. Tomorrow, Thursday night, we are having um, a conversation between two very interesting people, uh, Khabibi, has been with us since the very beginning and everybody knows that she's a fabulous dancer and that that she uh, is passionate about the, the dance forms of West Africa, Caribbean dance forms, but she is a practicing artist. So we are celebrating her, we'll be honoring her on Friday night at the concert. Hun has been with us for a while. He is not, he is a word artist. Uh, he didn't have time to tell a full story in the in the allotted section portion of last night's concert. So he will be telling a story and he will be sharing some of the artifacts that he and his wife have collected from the native peoples of the American North, uh, Central Northern American tribes. So it's going to be a very interesting and, and quite different you'll have a little more time to soak up the culture that both of these uh, wonderful longtime Common Ground instructors are gonna share with you tomorrow. And Friday, uh, Ellen Elms will be joining us to talk with us about uh, the murals that she paints, um, the social justice that she strives for visually in enhancing a community with these wonderful murals that she designs. So please join us at 6.30 Thursday and Friday night for those gallery talks. And don't forget, you can go to the Common Ground official YouTube site and watch any of the ones that you missed. I just, I missed Monday's keynote and I just enjoyed it last night after the concert. What a great speaker. Uh, so please, please enjoy all the ones that you've missed. Thanks for joining us tonight. Don't forget the concert starts at eight. See you 